Hey friends, today I want us to encounter Jesus and bring our pain and our brokenness to Jesus. John the Baptist, when he was in prison and he heard that Jesus was ministering, he sent his disciples to ask, are you the one, the Messiah, the one we're waiting for? And here's what Jesus said. You go tell John and report to him that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. And blessed are you, John, and everybody else who does not fall away on account of me. Jesus wanted John to know that you can know that the Messiah has come because all of these good things in perspective of healing are happening now. So that leaves us with some questions as we come to this subject. One is, what does God think about my pain? What does he feel? What does he want? Secondly, how do we as the church face this subject of healing? And thirdly, how do I personally come to him with the pain and the brokenness of my life? We're going to visit Matthew chapter 8 today and see what God has to say through a series of healings that Jesus does. So come along, let's pray together, let's worship, and then we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you want to do in our lives. And so we come, we unzip our hearts and lives, asking you to come and speak to us, reveal yourself to us. And we dare to bring our whole self to you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to have an encounter with Jesus. We pray in his wonderful name. Amen. I've seen the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes His love and mercy poured out All I see is love and mercy Washing over all our sin, the people sing, the people sing, Hosanna, Hosanna. To take their place A selfless faith A selfless faith And I see a new revival Stirring as we pray And seek you God We're on our knees We're on our knees
everything I am is for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. g 
It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only Great are you church fam kids games is back this summer guys we are so excited to announce we got four weeks of camps for your kids here at the church we're so excited for your kids to come back put on their kids game shirt come hang out with their friends we are excited for kids games 2021 this summer yo it's gonna be epic yes. i'll be there my name is crystal james will be there this is james walton and for all of our kids at heart but are in the business world we have our business mixer coming up on Monday where we're talking about small businesses and the new experience. I love our bottom line community. It is so wonderful to connect with business like minded individuals. So come. We'll see you on Monday. Speaking of things that are back at it again, we got morning date coming Sunday, May 2nd, uh, where Jeff and Peggy Moore are going to be sharing about parenting and marriage together. So make sure you drop your kids off at our children's ministry program. We have birth through sixth grade where we're going to have an awesome time with them. But you guys get to go have a morning date with Jeff and Peggy. And ladies, our spring Bible study is back and it's starting this Tuesday, April 20th. Many options for you to choose from as far as which Bible study you'll be in, but regardless of the one that you choose, it is a wonderful opportunity for community and to dive in the word together. So make sure you join us. All the information we just talked about for all these different awesome events are available online. So if you have any questions, go check out our website and you can get more info there. See you next time. Our next act of worship is an invitation to participate by giving. Giving is an act of faith and trust, joyfully responding to God through our financial offerings and a regular tithe. Worshiping in this way can be an intentional act of gratitude in response to God's abundant provision in our lives. Giving is a concrete way we collaborate with God to impact our global partners and local community with initiatives that seek the common good share the good news, and promote flourishing. Join me now in praying for God's blessing on these tithes and offerings, and then I'd invite you to pause the service and participate through either texting to give at the number on the screen or giving through our website. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for all the ways you sustain and provide for us. The world is alive with your generosity and abundance. Let our lives in word and deed bring you honor as we join you in blessing the world around us, sharing our resources with the poor and marginalized, seeking the lost, and binding up the brokenhearted. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to Matthew chapter 8, you and I are going to see a series of events, encounters that Jesus has related to the subject of healing and at first we think wow this is astounding it's just bam 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 subjects of healing but what we don't have are what happens in between these moments it seems like Matthew has strung together almost like a series of pearls being strung in a necklace purposefully paragraphs that relate to Jesus and the subject of healing. They all seem to happen on the same day. The advantage that you and I have is that we now can dive in, have an encounter with Jesus, and learn from the kingdom of God's perspective the subject of healing. So let's begin in Matthew 8 verse 1. And I have to tell you, this is going to be steak and lobster. So you might as well put your bib on because we are going to feast in God's word together. It says, when he came down from the mountainside, remember, this is right after the Beatitudes. So he comes down the mountain. And if you go to Capernaum today, you'll see that there's this mountain where he spoke the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. He comes down, crosses this Roman road, and goes right into the village where he lived 
which was Capernaum. He comes down the mountainside and a large crowd follows him. And a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Let me say that again, because that's key. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So the man has leprosy. We don't hear about that much today, but even in the last century, there was cases where people were uh, infected with leprosy, this bacterial disease, skin disease, called Hansen's disease, and even on the island of Molokai, Hawaii, all the people on the islands of Hawaii that had leprosy were shipped to the northern part of the island and they were kept away from everybody else so that they couldn't give this disease away. There's a wonderful story about Father Damien, a Christian who spent his entire life ministering to people who had leprosy. And in the end, he gave his life for these people that he loved because he also contracted leprosy. But here's the paradox here. A man who is broken. It's leprosy here, but it could be your disease, my disease. He comes in his brokenness to Jesus who brings healing. So you catch the paradox. Wholeness versus brokenness. He comes to him and the question is, are you willing? If you are willing. How many times have you and I asked God that question? God, I don't know if you want to heal me. I don't know if you're around. I don't know if you care. But if you are around, if you do care, would you please do it? Where we're putting the emphasis on God's wanting. Do you want to do this? Are you willing? And Matthew wants us to know that this is not an issue that you and I should be wrestling with. What does God care about my brokenness? And right out of the gate, Matthew wants us to seal up this issue, God cares. I love what the New Living Translation does with this. They switch the word from willing to want because it's the same word. They're just synonyms. But listen to the strength of it. If you want to, pause. Does God want to make things right? Does God care? It's paramount that we answer this question. And Jesus answers the question, I want to. This is messianic. When the Messiah comes, he wants to make all things well. Right. The way he created it in the beginning. We have to get this in our minds because otherwise we're just mamsy pamsy in our prayers. We don't know, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. We'll deal with the rest of the variables regarding healing as we go through the message. But the first variable is does God care? Does he want to? When the Messiah comes close to us, does he put things right? And the answer is absolutely yes. I want to. I am willing. And he responds and says, be clean. But notice, he touches the man. He crosses a boundary that was established in the Old Testament. You can't touch a leper. You can't be around a leper. The Old Testament Torah refused that anyone would do this because they were were putting themselves at risk of contracting the disease. And Jesus crosses the barrier and touches him and makes him clean and displays his power to heal. Then he wraps it all up and he says, now go fulfill the Torah, which commands you, if you are healed, to go check it out with the priest so that he can verify 
and give you the stamp of approval that yes, you're good to go. You can move back into the community. So God is willing. Otherwise, we end up ourselves being more caring and loving than God. We care. We care for these people that are sick, but does God care? We can't put ourselves in a position where we are more loving and caring than God. He is the paramount lover of your soul, your body, your marriage, everything about you. The creation where God creates everything good, the incarnation, the crucifixion, all show us God's big redemptive heart. Now sure, there are problems when it comes to evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why am I in a wheelchair? Why did this disease come my way? Why did my marriage fall apart? And C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, The Problem with Pain, he deals with all of this, and even in the pain of his own life, with the loss of his wife to cancer, uh, in the book he wrote, A Grief Observed, he's dealing with these issues, these very issues. But we have to be careful that we make God not in our image but we read the scriptures as Jesus is presented to us and he's presented to us as the person who cares for you and me he's not just your soul doctor the enlightenment and the Greek dualism of the ancient world painted oftentimes God as only caring about the soul and particularly in these modern times, it feels like the church is the sole doctor and everybody else cares about society, everybody else cares about their bodies, uh, the, the economy, uh, social issues. But the Bible paint, paints the picture of the Messiah is holistic. God in the Old Testament has always been holistic. And so as the Messiah comes, he is holistic bringing us redemption. Related to this is there's been in, in the last century a doctrine that came out called dispensationalism that paints the picture where God cared about people's bodies but once uh, the last apostle died uh, God doesn't do that anymore. He doesn't heal people anymore that he only heals souls and then when Jesus comes again he will put everything right. And even though that fits into often our narrative, that's not, again, what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God cares for the whole of you, not just your soul. And then sometimes we make God as the author of good and evil. We say, well, God gave me this disease or God's doing this in my life. God's used... Granted, God makes... Uh, he turns all things to good for those that love him and, and uh, follow him. But the second thing is, is that he is not the, ever the author of evil. James says that let no one say that God is the author of evil. God can use it. God can turn it around. Zoroastrianism that came out of ancient Iran taught that there was this God who was dualistic. And he did good and he did evil and you didn't know what you were going to get. That is not our God. Because you won't come to him. You won't pray to him if we're fearful of what he's, what he's going to do. And God is not too weak. It's not that just that he's good but he's kind of weak. He can't change things. God is good. He's strong. And he's present. He's here. Now there are reasons beyond my knowing, some I'll mention in this message, but I'm sure the rest are beyond my knowing, as we wait between the first coming and the second coming, and not everybody's healed, not everything is put right. We live in the already but not yet, where Christ has come, but the fulfillment has not yet happened. So in this already but not yet tension, there are multiple reasons why maybe I'm not healed at this particular moment. I do love it when some people will come to me and I, I say, you know, God didn't heal this or we, we haven't experienced that healing. They'll, they'll 
try to give me a band-aid by saying, well, maybe God just wants you to be in the hospital so you can witness to the, uh, the nurse. And my, I, I know what they're doing. They're trying to console me. But I think what God is doing is so much more complex than any of us could ever imagine. And besides, I would have gladly gone into the hospital and witnessed to the nurse without uh, getting that disease if that's exactly what he wanted. It's a complex issue, but we have to believe that Jesus wants to. The Apostle Paul, he came to Jesus with his need for healing. And he prayed three times. And I've kind of looked at this as a model in my own life. And I don't think he just tritely came three times. I think he passionately, maybe over a period of an hour or so, prayed for his healing. And then he backed away and he came back a second time. And he came a third time. And God spoke to him and he said, my grace is sufficient. Meaning, it's not happening right now. Just know I love you. Just know I'm willing. Just know that my abounding love is there. And that's enough for now. And that's kind of how I've taken it in my own life. If, if I'm just stuck praying and praying and praying and praying. Sometimes I, I forget to move on in my life. But paramount for me to know that Jesus cares. And he is he's on my side. I, I uh, met a taxi cab driver in London. In, in this wonderful encounter, he was taking me from the airport to my, or from the bus, or train, rather, to my hotel. And we struck into a conversation. He found out that I was there for a C.S. Lewis event, and, um, and he right away said, uh, I want nothing to do with God. And um, I said, well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that, but it sounds like there's a lot of passion there. Uh, do you mind telling me what, it, what it's all about? And he said um, that God took my grandson, broke my heart, and I hate God for that. And I didn't know what to say. And, but this word of wisdom, hopefully, that came to me in that moment, uh, I said to him, well, I'm on your side. In fact, I think God is on your side. He says, what do you mean? I just told you I don't want anything to do with God and you're telling me that God's on my side. And I said, well, the reason you don't want anything to do with God is because of the pain of the death of your grandson. And the Bible says that God is willing, that God loves, that God cares. And the very fact that you're resentful of God shows that you know instinctively that God should care about this. Do you get that? It's not just that God should care. He does care. But we live in a broken and complicated world. So there it is. Point number one. God is willing. Secondly, we come to verse five. And now we encounter this centurion. And here we're going to see God bring us to the issue of our own life. And that is do we believe, faith, that he's loving and kind towards us? Where are our hearts? Look at verse 5 with me. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and asked for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. This is still in Capernaum, this little village where Jesus lived by Lake Galilee. The centurion replied, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with this great faith. I say to you, many will come from the east and to the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, meaning he's predicting that Gentiles will come and eat 
with Israelites, Isaac and Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He concludes in verse 13 to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you have believed it would. And the servant was healed that very hour. So the centurion, this man who is a soldier who oversees 100 other soldiers in the Roman force, he comes to Jesus. And here, there's another boundary that Jesus crosses. Remember, he's already crossed the boundary of healing the leper with leprosy. You weren't supposed to even be around him. And Jesus actually touched the leper. Now, it's the ethnic boundary. The boundary where uh, you are not to go into the house of a Gentile and become unclean. And so the centurion knows that. And he says, Jesus, I don't want to mess you up. I know you're not supposed to go into my house. And I just tell these people to do this. And you can just give the order and, and it'll happen. But it's this boundary. It's this ethnic boundary between Jew and Gentile. And Jesus crosses all of these boundaries through his ministry. He crosses ethnic boundaries, social boundary, economic boundary, caste boundaries, religious boundaries, and gender boundaries. And I love that Jesus is creating something new that Paul eventually is going to call in the book of Ephesians and the book of Galatians a new race. A new race that includes everybody of all races and ethnicities and genders. And we all come together and find our new race in Jesus Christ. This is something I think is critical for us to see Jesus tackling right at the get-go of his ministry. Ray Stedman, years ago up in Palo Alto in his church there where he was eventually writing his great book on Ephesians, he calls Christians the third race. The third race. And this idea of us becoming a new people that's not a part of this tribe or a part of that tribe, but a new race. This is key because Satan's work is always to divide. It's always to recreate the Tower of Babel where there's distrust, where somebody's better, somebody's worse, someone inferior, someone has more. The wars of the them, us continue to go on. In Jesus' day, it was the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews thought themselves to be better than the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't call themselves Gentiles. They called themselves Greeks. And they thought they were better than the barbarians that lived to the north outside of the Roman Empire. Similarly, in the Asian world, the Chinese considered themselves to be better than people who were north of the Great Wall of China. In fact, the word China, the etymology of that word is, is middle. And they considered themselves kind of to be Middle Earth, the center, and the people that were in the north and the south and the West were outside of what is best. Or in India, the caste system and, and how you have this pecking order of who's better than who. Now, we have a caste system here in our own society where you begin to learn that in junior high of who has more, who's smarter, who's more beautiful, who has more friends, who has more likes on their Facebook page. It goes on and on and on. And it's key that we find our identity and unity in Jesus Christ. So the centurion says, I don't deserve for you to come in and break your custom. But Jesus just smiles and just says, wow, this is wonderful. And he calls attention to his faith. So the first point is God is willing. He loves you. But the second point is faith. Our faith. And what do we put our faith in? Because he calls attention to the fact that he's not seen this faith in all of Israel. 
And here's a Gentile having the faith of a a Messiah Jew. Faith is not simply believing that Jesus could do it. A lot of times when we're praying for healing or we're praying for a miracle or we're praying for someone's salvation, we feel like we just got to somehow squeeze faith out of us. Our focus is not on the event we're praying for. Our focus is on the person we're praying to. Ooh, I like that. Let me say that again. Our focus is not on the event we're praying for, but the who we are praying to. Jesus, does he love you? Does he care? Is he here? Does he have the power to do it? Yes, 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 yes. That's who I'm praying to. So that if it happens instantly, if it happens over time, or I don't see it until Jesus comes a second time, my faith is not rocked because my faith is not in the event. My faith is in the person I'm praying to. Faith, another way to think of faith is loving surrender loving trust lord i trust you no matter what happens i trust you there's a great line out of uh, the book of daniel where shadrach meshach and abednego are threatened to be thrown into the furnace of fire and they say you know what our god is able to save us and there's there's the miracle right and and god actually does but i love the tagline on that and even if he doesn't we will not serve you and your God we will serve the God of Israel what a great stance for you and I to have in everything that our faith is in this God who loves us who's faithful to us that we can put all of our eggs into his basket because we can trust him This loving surrender. And then we come to the third part of the series of healings found in verse 14. You're still there, right? Just checking. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. Isn't that wonderful? Because here it is. It's not church. It's not out in the street. It's not some great big crusade. This is in the home. This is at the end of the day. We kind of often don't know what to do with the domestic Jesus. The Jesus that's just me and him in life. Lord, I can't find a parking place. What am I going to do? I'm supposed to be there. Can I pray that prayer? Give me a parking place. This kind of Jesus that's intimately involved. And Jesus comes over to Peter's mother-in-law. It's not his mother. It's his mother-in-law. And he touches her and heals her. And the fever goes. And then when evening came. So apparently they they go ahead and eat. And then when evening came. uh, Many who were demon possessed. Who uh, were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word. And he healed, and circle that, he healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities, Isaiah 53. So Jesus heals all the sick. And this is telling us, this is what Messiah does when Messiah fully comes, when he shows up, and here he is. When Messiah comes a second time, he will put all things right. That all will be made well. All. In the in-between, we have these break-ins of the kingdom of God. Sometimes we call them revivals. Um, These moments where it just seems like God is on the move. When Jesus becomes fully present, this is what he does because this is his nature. Now, let's talk about hindrances to healing. Are you okay with that? Let's just kind of delve into this area that we often have problems with. Uh, 
unbelief. Don't ever let anybody tell you you could have been healed, uh, but you're, you don't have the faith. Do you feel that? You came in sick in your body, and now you go out wounded in your soul because someone just spoke that over you. That's a horrible thing for someone to say that about another person. Yeah, maybe I don't have the faith that I should or could, but there's a lot of other things that might be going on. Timing, maybe God has a different timing. Method, maybe God wants to do things a different way. Sin, maybe there's sin in my life or maybe there's sin in the church that's hindering the moving of the spirit individually or in the church. Maybe the presence of the Spirit of God is not as strong as it was in certain periods. Have you ever noticed that the Bible records extraordinary miracles as if they were extraordinary? Yeah. Extraordinary miracles are extraordinary. Paul couldn't heal himself. Paul couldn't heal Epaphroditus. Yet there are times where even the shadow of Peter healed everybody that that he was walking past. There are these moments, I call them high tide spiritual moments, where the Spirit of God is moving so strongly and there's a lot of people healed, but there's also low tides. And by the way, pray for our nation. I think we're in extremely low tide right now. And we need a fresh move of the Spirit of God. And then I would just say, I don't know. I don't have to have the reason why, 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 why. I have a file this thick of whys, and God hasn't answered any of my whys. But let me ask you, does everyone you witness to get saved? Are you going to stop witnessing? Does every day you go to work, is that an awesome day? Are you going to stop going to work? Life just isn't like that. It's, it's complicated. And so we continue to pray for the sick. And we, we see sometimes these extraordinary moments of touch and healing. So God is willing. He loves you. We put our trust and our faith in him. Not into the healing but into him himself. And then finally he carried our infirmities. When he died on the cross legally Judicially, when he died on the cross, he carried the brokenness of the world and he comes again to put things right. So now, where do we go from here? We come with the already but not yet where we are following Jesus in the now just like the early disciples and we pray for the sick. We bring people to Jesus. I'm not bringing them to me. I'm bringing them to Jesus. Knowing that that is what Jesus ultimately wants in the kingdom of God. When we we all get there together, all will be made well. I had a a moment where I was driving uh, back from visiting my dad who is not doing well. And obviously he one day is going, going to die in his brokenness, but we have prayed and we've seen multiple times where God has intervened over the last 10 years of suffering. And as I'm driving back, I get a call from a pastor friend down in southeast San Diego who just was calling to say hi, tell me he loves me, and we had this great exchange. He says, hey Mark, you want to hear about a miracle that happened? I said, yeah, I want to hear about this miracle that happened. He said, you know, we were praying for this family that had come to Christ and and they had different physical and emotional issues in their lives. And we were just laying hands, praying for each of the members of the family. And and one of the people in the family um, was autistic and had never spoken in her life. I think she was seven years old and never talked. And, um, And when they finished praying this little girl turned to her mother and said, Mommy, I love you. And the whole place just broke down sobbing. Her mom had never heard those words from her daughter. And I don't know if she's fully healed. I don't know 
uh, all the intricacies about that. But when I heard the story, I thought Jesus and the kingdom of God came close. Came very, very close to the family. And one day, the family will be completely well. But Jesus came close. So let's close today and let's pray that Jesus would come close to you. And, and by the way, if you have never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus today. I'm, I'm going to guide you in a prayer. And this is your opportunity to bring your brokenness, your heartache, and your sin to Jesus and have him make you well. Let's pray. Father, thank you this day that you are alive and well in the kingdom of God. The rulership of Jesus is alive and present in our midst today. And Lord, we bring to you all of the stuff of us. We don't want to be dualistic where we only bring spiritual issues to you. But we bring our spiritual issues, our sin. We bring to you our emotional issues. We bring to you our relational brokenness with other people. We bring to you our economic needs. We bring to you our physical ailments. We ask you, Lord, to save us. We ask you, Messiah, to come near us and to touch us and to make us well. And we, like the centurion, we believe in you, Lord, that you are willing, and that you love us and that you're here. And while we're praying, if you want to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ right now, pray this prayer with me. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you did die for my sins. And so I give you, Lord, all my ugliness, my brokenness, my hurt, and the stuff that I'm ashamed of, I give it all to you. I push it over to you, Jesus, knowing that you died on the cross for this stuff. And I receive your forgiveness instead. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. For from this day forward, like the leper, like the centurion, even like Peter's mother-in-law, Lord, I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, as we go back into a time of worship in this last song, you'll see a text on the screen that will allow you to text me to let me know that you prayed that prayer. And uh, I'll be back in just a moment to pray a prayer for all of us. Dread 
quench my soul as mercy and grace unfold a hunger and thirst a hunger and thirst with arms stretched wide I know you hear my cry speak to me to me now and I surrender and I surrender and I want to know you more and I want to know you more and I surrender What a time we have had today. So good to worship with you. So good to be with you. And now let me pray a blessing upon your life. I pray that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has now become our God, that he would lift up his face and shine his goodness, his love, his peace, his healing. He lift up his face and shine upon you. That he would be gracious unto you, giving you and I what we don't deserve. And that he would grant you shalom, peace. In Jesus' name, amen.